We've brought many new exciting features to the Google Earth Enterprise Client and the Google Earth Pro Client in version 5.2. The first is a long user requested feature that is to enable Military Grid Reference System or MGRS and the US National Grid or USNG coordinate systems in the viewer. We can see this working by searching for any MGRS coordinate. All you have to do is type in the search box the MGRS coordinate of your interest and you'll be flown directly to that coordinate on the Earth. In this case, I've just entered the coordinate for the Google headquarters in Mountain View, California. Also, as I move my cursor around the screen, you can see that the MGRS coordinate for my cursor position is updated at the bottom of the screen. I can enable this by going to the Preferences menu and choosing MGRS as my default coordinate system. I also have the ability to create place marks and to move those place marks around the screen any place I'd like to choose and automatically be able to easily copy the coordinate system and pass that coordinate off to any other user. If you're using Google Earth Pro or you're using the Google Earth Enterprise Client 5.2 on the internet level, you'll have access to what are known as Pro-only layers. These Pro-only layers will show up under the Layers dialog and allow you to have exclusive content provided to only your user group. The first is the U.S. Demographics layer. Here in Falls Church, Virginia, I can zoom out until I find different census blocks. By clicking on a block group, I can figure out the current census data that we have about this particular block group. For instance, if I wanted to see the marital statuses, or if I wanted to see the education level, I can do this for either the current year or projected to 2014. The second layer is the U.S. parcel data which we've compiled for the entire United States. This allows you to zoom in, see parcel outlines, and also to click on any parcel and get detailed reports about that parcel. If you'd like even more data, you can click from DataQuick, which will open up the new embedded browser in Google Earth 5.2 to a website which will allow you to pay for a more enhanced report about that parcel of information. The final pro-only layer is the U.S. daily traffic counts. This allows you to fly to anywhere where we have traffic count data, say for instance here on West Broad Street. I can click on this little car icon and I'll get a summary of the traffic count data. This is extremely useful if you're thinking about placing a billboard because you'll get statistics about the number of cars that travel through this intersection on any given day and you'll get the ability to see the trends over a few years. For instance, here in 1997 there were 35,000 cars and now in 2000 there were 30,000 cars. So you might determine that this is a decreasing area of traffic. There have also been significant enhancements to measurements in Google Earth 5.2. Measurements are the concept of using Google Earth to measure distances on the ground against the imagery with which you are looking. You can access the measurement tools by clicking on the ruler in the toolbar. In this case, we'll do a basic measurement, just to show some of the accuracy. So we'll use a line, and we'll go over to yards. I'm using the giant stadium football field here because I have clearly marked distances on the ground. If I take the first point and click at the intersection of the end zone and the sideline, and then click my second point at the intersection of the other end zone in the sideline, I'll get a measurement of nearly 100 yards. This is well within the ground sample distance and error that's inherent in this imagery. But still you can see that the measurement tool is highly accurate. The second enhancement will take us down to Hobbs Air Force Base in New Mexico. Here we find a bombing target. I can use the circle tool change my units of measurement to feet, and estimate the center of this bombing target. I will click once, and then use this radius tool to drive a radius out to the different measurements. Here we see this first ring is at 100 feet, the second ring at 200 feet, the third ring at 300 feet, and the final ring of the target at 500 feet. Finally, we've also greatly enhanced the ability to measure paths. Paths are so different than lines in that they can include multiple points. So here we are at the Grand Canyon. There's two modes of editing this path. The first, as I start here on this eastern side of the canyon, is to simply click once, then click a second time, a third, and a fourth, and so on, creating a multi-point path. However, 
If I want more detail, and I'd like my vertices to be more dense, I can hold down the mouse button and then simply drag all along the Google Earth. I can go down the canyon and then snake back up to the other side. When I'm done with this measurement, I can save it as a KML file. I'll just leave the default path measure as the name. You'll notice that this path tool will automatically tessellate or follow the Earth's surface across the canyon. This is particularly useful because now we can use this path to see an elevation profile using the Google Earth Elevation API. I just need to right click on the path and choose Show Elevation Profile and I'll be presented with an interactive chart which will show me things such as the distances, the total change in elevation, and the slope at any given point. As I move my mouse along the chart, you'll see that there's a corresponding icon showing me the distance, the slope, and the elevation all along this path. We've greatly enhanced the interaction with GPS devices in Google Earth 5.2. GPS has long been a component of Google Earth, and there's two ways in which the GPS can be used with the application. From under the Tools menu, if we look at the GPS submenu, we see that there are two tabs, an Import and a Real-Time tab. The Import tab allows us to connect to a device, which is either physically connected or over Bluetooth, to allow us to download a recorded waypoint track from that device. The Real-Time tab will allow us to connect to either a physically connected or via Bluetooth connection GPS and use the current location of that device to update the display in Google Earth. So we could be driving or flying or in a boat and the Google Earth display would actually move along with us. I can also use the file menu to open a GPX file. A GPX file is a universally supported open format for GPS waypoints. In this case, I'm going to import a helicopter tour that I recently took in Marco Island, Florida. Once I choose my GPX file, I can choose to bring in the tracks, the line strings, and I can also choose to adjust this to the ground height. Now line strings have always been there in Google Earth. We've always had the ability to bring in a GPX file and be able to create just a simple line of waypoints. The tracks feature is new and we'll go into a greater discussion about what that means here. Because this is a helicopter tour, I don't want to adjust the altitude to the ground height. I want to keep the altitude component here because I was in a helicopter and I was above the ground. So I'm going to click OK. The file will import and you'll see the entire extent as the Google Earth client expands to the extent of the GPX track. Underneath the tracks, you have two options, a little blue arrow and then a folder. The folder represents what we've traditionally imported into Google Earth, which is all these little blue arrows on the screen here, each individual headings for different waypoints along of our track. I'm going to go ahead and disable those now. What I really want to show is the new tracks function. So I want to highlight this track, and then down here in this context menu, I want to click the button to play the tour. The first thing that's going to happen is we will zoom to the very first position in our tour. The time bar at the top will rewind itself to the very beginning of the tour and the tour will start playing. In this case you can see me driving along the road as I head up to the airport. If I skip forward I can move to the part of the tour where I've loaded into the helicopter and I can click the play button to resume at any point in time and I'll smoothly track myself as I fly around the island. This functionality has never been available before in Google Earth, but it makes for a really fascinating way to review the tours that you've been on, whether they were in a helicopter, or in a car, or perhaps even in a boat. As with the previous example, where we had a line string that we created from a measurement, we have a line string here created from the tour of this GPS track. That means that we can right click on it and show the elevation profile using the Google Earth Elevation API. However, because this is actually has a lot more detail, it's not just a line string, it's a line string with a fourth dimension of time, the motion chart that we have now allows us to simultaneously see altitude as well as speed changes over time. So as I move along the path, just like before, my icon on the screen will update, and I can see, for instance, where we took off here, and the speed of the helicopter sped up, 
as did our elevation. As this user produced YouTube video shows, you can replace the default icon from the GPS track with something more appropriate. In this case, the user imported a 3D collada file of this airplane, and when you follow it taking down the runway, it looks very, very lifelike. There are also great improvements in the way that user data can be added to Google Earth. First, let's talk about vector data. What we'll do first is describe the way that vector data was traditionally added to the Google Earth Enterprise client, or the Google Earth Pro client. We offer two methods, the vector sample and the vector crop. But we've introduced a new mechanism which we'll describe in detail called vector regenate. Vector data, such as shape files, can automatically be brought into the Google Earth Pro and Enterprise clients and converted into KML. Do this by saying file, import, and choosing a shape file of interest. If the shape file is large, like this one, you'll get a notification that the client really is only designed for about 2,500 entities at a time. So you can sample and just simply get a quick preview of what this shapefile contains and it will simply bring in the first 2500 entities inside of that shapefile. Google Earth also allows you to crop large vector files when they are too large to load into the client in their entirety. In this example will import the counties of the United States but we will decide to limit the import to the size of the viewer, in this case Florida. The result is the full KML of the state, but only this state, not the rest of the United States. New in the 5.2 client for Google Earth Pro and Google Earth Enterprise is vector regenation. From the tools menu, choose Regenate, and you can choose an input file such as a large KML like the counties of the United States. The tool will ask you where you'd like to save the regenerated export. You can create a folder and hit the Regenate button to begin the process. Once the file is regenerated, it will open up in the client. The result is a KML that loads up very, very detailed contents, whether they're points, lines, or polygons, but only for the area that's inside the browser window. This is much more efficient than trying to load all the vector data at once. Finally, we've also improved the way in which we can add raster data to Google Earth. Here we'll show the original ways that we added raster data, scaling, and cropping, and finally, the new methodology, which is the raster super overlay technique. The first way to bring imagery into Google Earth is using something called raster sampling. To sample a raster image, go to the file menu and click on import. Choose the geospatially referenced image, in this case a TIFF that you're interested in, and Google Earth will automatically fly you to the location in the world that that image bounding box covers. Here you will be given the option to crop, scale, or create a super overlay. First, we're going to scale. This creates a sample of the image at a lower resolution. The benefit is that you get the entire image in Google Earth. However, the downside of this approach is that you've limited the amount of detail in the image. So as we zoom in here, we see that there's been quite a bit of degradation of the imagery. The second method for importing raster imagery into Google Earth is to crop the image. Select the geospatially referenced image you'd like from the File Import menu, in this case a GeoTIFF. The GeoTIFF will automatically fly the client to the location of the world in which it is located. From the Options menu that comes up, select that you would like to crop this image. The next step is to click a center point. And now what happens is Google Earth will automatically determine the largest area at this resolution possible inside of the client. And it will automatically crop the image at full resolution to that largest area possible. The downside of this is that you lose the entire image. However, you do maintain the entire pixel integrity of the image. So as you zoom in here, you still maintain the full resolution and the image is very, very clear. New in Google Earth 5.2 is the ability to create super overlays from raster images of any size. You can do this directly in the client by doing File, Import, and choosing any large image, such as this over 600 megabyte GeoTIFF. The client will automatically fly to the location on the Earth in which this image is located, 
and you will be presented with a dialog box asking you how to handle this image. You want to select to create a super overlay. You will be prompted to put an output folder where you would like to save the imagery tiles and KML links which will be written by the super overlay generator. This is all done inside of the client and you don't need any third party applications. Once the image has been turned into a super overlay, it will automatically load into the client. The result is a full resolution image which is very very efficient in the browser. This means that it doesn't take up a lot of memory for you to fly around this very very large image. You can zoom in to any resolution and you will get the full and complete pixel integrity of this image no matter where you fly. This works by loading up a series of tiles similar to how we stream imagery in Google Earth today. Thank you for your time and if you have any further questions I encourage you to please visit earth.google.com. Thanks and have a great day.